Law 529, Lecture on Section 5 of the Evidence Act 1950. Okay, we have basically covered our all concepts on most of the concepts in evidence law in our previous slides. There were 10 slides given to you on uh, the introduction and important concepts. So today we are going to proceed on to look at section 5 of the Evidence Act 1950. Now, what is there in section 5? Now let's look at your Evidence Act 1950. Basically, section 5 says, Evidence may be given of facts and issue and relevant facts. Evidence may be given in any suit or proceeding of the existence or non-existence of every facts and issue and of such other facts as are hereinafter declared to be relevant. Now, if you refer to the slides here, slide number 3, basically, when you look at that, section 5 have two kinds of evidence. Now, section 5 is the provision relates to relevancy and section 5 provides you with a prerequisite that whenever you are to tender evidence in the court, evidence when you are tendering it in the court, it has to be relevant to the facts and issue and it can also be relevant to the relevant facts that may be indirectly relates to the facts and issue. So, that will be the position in the section 5. Now, when you look at the, the section again, you have the words there of no others. What does it mean by evidence relevant uh, to be relevant and of no others? The, the phrase of no others basically means that you cannot tend the evidence unless it is relevant. So this provision or this phrase precluded any evidence that you are tendering in the court unless it is relevant. So it, it excluded everything which are not relevant to the facts and issue. Now let's look at some examples on section 5. Okay, last time when we talk about direct evidence, remember direct evidence can be relevant, sorry, direct evidence, the concept have been explained to you under section 60, where you are talking about oral evidence. Now when you talk about oral evidence, oral evidence has to be direct. So, direct evidence under section 60 will be the one that concerns with oral evidence and this is an example of best evidence under the best evidence rule. So, whatever you perceive in the court will be what you have to testify in the court and you are giving it directly under section 60. Also, when you discuss about direct evidence is where we are looking at it in the context of section 5. Just now, when we look at section 5, section 5 is basically the law on relevancy Right, if you are bring, to bring evidence in the court, it has to be relevant. And one part of this is that the relevant evidence that you tender has to be direct evidence related to the facts and issue. Yeah, this is why you have the words just now. If you look at that, if you look at your provision, you have evidence may be given of every facts and issue. So that will be evidence which are directly related to the facts and issue. This will be what I consider as the best evidence under the best evidence rule and the evidence of this kind normally will carry much weight and the other one will be your tendering evidence which are relevant evidence, yeah? evidence of relevant fact. It may not be relevant directly to the facts in issue but it, is, it may be indirectly. This is where you look at circumstantial evidence. Yeah? We have looked at this one last time. So, say for example, you have a situation where Ali killed Mona, right? What you got to prove is basically the actor's fears and the mens rea. Say for example, you have Zach who saw Ali stabbed Mona three times. So, what Zach did is actually giving evidence of the act of killing, that is the actor's fears, which can prove that Ali killed Mona. So, Zach's evidence will be relevant and the kind of evidence Zach will be giving will be direct evidence in the context of Section 5 because his evidence will directly prove the actor's fear which is basically one of the elements of the crime and Zach's evidence will also be regarded as direct evidence in the context of Section 60 because Zach here will be testifying in the court as to what he perceives in the court yeah so this will be where you are talking about oral evidence has to be direct 
So when you talk about Z here, in the context of section 5, this is where, so when you talk about Z evidence here, so in the context of section 5 here, then you are talking about this part, yeah, direct evidence which relates to the facts in issue, right? And say for example, you have another situation where you have Dawood, who is Ali's best friend. Yeah, Ali went home, seen by Dawood who was at that time watching TV, and Dawood basically observed that uh, da uh, Ali was agitated and he saw also, he also saw some blood stains on the shirt and hands of Dawood, uh, sorry, of Ali. So now, you are going to call Dawood to give evidence in the court. Dawood will be a prosecution witness and the kind of evidence that Dawood will be giving will be direct evidence. Yeah, so Dawood here will be giving yeah, doubt here will be giving direct evidence under section 60 will be what he perceived. So basically what he perceived will be the fact that Ali's hand covered with blood, he looked agitated. Yeah, this is what he perceived, section 60 of the Evidence Act, which is direct evidence observed by doubt. And in relation to section 5, yeah, in relation to section 5, Dawood here did not actually see the actors just in the menstria. He did not see the act of killing and he also will not going to be able to determine the menstria. However, in the context of section 5, doubt evidence may be relevant facts to the facts and issue. So the observation, which is the aftermath of the facts and issue, will be relevant in the context of circumstantial evidence here. So the evidence in the context of section 5 will be relevant evidence and this is also allowed by Section 5 of the Evidence Act. So here we find that the evidence given by doubt here is not the best evidence under the best evidence rule in Section 5. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter because this evidence will be relevant as long as you can fulfill the element of relevancy. Alright? So you've got that. Now the issue here is... Sorry. The issue here is so the keyword that you have to bear in mind under section 5 is relevancy relevancy which is under section 5 section 5 provides you with the precondition whenever you tender evidence in the court it has to be relevant to the facts and issue now the question here is okay uh who will determine yeah who will determine relevancy so the question here is who will determine relevancy and what will be the power of that authority to determine relevancy? And the how question, how will the authority determine relevancy? The case to illustrate to you on relevancy will be the case of Anwar Ibrahim. Yeah, Anwar Ibrahim number three. Yeah, I have perhaps mentioned this case with you. Now, what happened in this case is that you have here Anwar Ibrahim. Yeah, it, there was a complaint made by Anwar Ibrahim by Umi Hafilda. So she made a complaint to the police saying that she Anwar Ibrahim has an affair with his brother ataupun dia punya adi angkat dia which is Sukma and at that time Anwar Ibrahim was the deputy prime minister and he was also the finance minister. So because of the complaint made by Umi Hafilda, police start investigation. <coughs> So the police conduct investigation. <coughs> now what happened here is that Anwar Ibrahim called the police and by virtue of his position as the Deputy Prime Minister and the Finance Minister asked the police to stop investigation into his case. So that is why Anwar Ibrahim now is, is charged for abuse of power. So Anwar Ibrahim here, the offence is abuse of power so he is charged for abuse of power using his position to stop police investigation and the actress stress that you have to prove. So the actress stress and men's stress that you basically have to prove will be that Anwar Ibrahim is public official and he is using his position as public officials unlawfully 
and he has intention to use his public official for that purpose. If you look at this one, of course, it doesn't matter who you are, by virtue of rule of law and equality before the law, whether you are a prime minister or deputy prime minister, if you commit a crime, you have to be, you can be investigated and there's no way they, can, they will look at your position yeah, to stop investigation. So what happened here is that Noah Ibrahim used that position to stop investigation. And in this case, what happened was that the defense team during trial wished to call Tun Mahade. Mahade, at that time he was the Prime Minister and Rafida Aziz. Right? So the prosecutor, sorry, not the prosecutor, the defense team wished for the prosecutor to call. Uh, Mahade and Rafida Aziz. So, in this question, in this situation, what happened here is that the judge in this case, at least the late of uh, Augustine Paul, inquire into why do you want to call these two persons, right? So, you're talking about who has the power to decide what and how. Yeah. So, this will be the case for you to look at. So, the judge in this case basically asked the prosecution team, eh, sorry, the defense team. As to why you want to call Mahade and Ravida Aziz, whether these two individuals here relevant to be called or not to give evidence in the court. Now, in answer to the question given by the judge, basically the defense team says that the reason why I'm calling Rafida Aziz and Mahade is to show to you that there is a conspiracy. Yeah, there was a conspiracy to topple Anwar Ibrahim. To crush his political career. So that is the argument put forward by the defense team. Now, what the judge did was that asking question. So the judge now looked at the actus reus and the mens rea, the provision in which he was charged for, and the judge says that, well, in the section in which Anwar Ibrahim is being charged, there were no element of conspiracy in the actus reus. So the judge says that. Conspiracy is not relevant, not admissible in the facts and issue. Therefore, the calling of Mahade and Rafida Aziz was not allowed. Yeah. So this is basically the case. So in answer to this question, right? Who will determine whether, who will determine where, who will be responsible in determining relevancy is going to be the judge. So the judge will be responsible in determining relevancy. Now, what is the source of power of the judge to determine relevancy? This is where you got to look at section 136, 165, 135. Now, let's look at section 136, sorry, 135, 136, 165. Yeah, just look at the section. Basically, under section 135, order of production and examination of witnesses. The order in which witnesses are produced and examined shall be regulated by the law and practice for the time being relating to civil and criminal procedure respectively and the absence of any such law by the discretion of the court. Now what is section 135 basically saying that if you are concerned with calling of witnesses, producing it as evidence in the court, you have to look at the law. So you have to look at the law basically, you have to look at the statute. Is there any statute that provides you with how to tender evidence in the court? So you're talking about production of witnesses. First of all, you look at the statute, meaning that you look at the Evidence Act. Requirement of the Evidence Act, the evidence has to be relevant. This will be Section 5, right? So the first and foremost, the court says that if you are to call witnesses, be it in civil or criminal cases, it will be by looking at Section 5, you tender evidence which are relevant. And if there is no clear provision, the court may exercise discretion under Section 135. So, Section 135 also recognizes the existence of court's discretion, right? If, if, uh, if there's an absence of such law. So, first of all, remember the sources of law, you refer to the Evidence Act. If there's no sources of law and clear, then the court will have to use discretion. So, this is where we, where we look at Section 135. Look at section 136, court to decide as to the admissibility of evidence. Just now we are talking about who is responsible in determining relevancy and admissibility. So basically it says that 
whether when each when either party proposes to give evidence of any fact the court may ask the party proposing to give evidence in what manner the alleged fact if proved would be relevant and the court shall admit the evidence if it thinks that the fact if proved would be relevant and no otherwise so section 136 here basically says that you can tender evidence in the court and it has to be relevant right so, maknanya, under section 136, reading together with section 5, the Evidence Act, the evidence that you tender in the court has to be relevant and determination of relevancy will be for the court to decide. <coughs> right? <coughs> so, if you look at that, so it is for the court to decide. The court may ask a party proposing to give evidence in what manner the alleged fact, it refers to the court's power. So the court here has a power to ask parties. So basically the court here have the power to ask parties or to ask questions. For what purpose? Determining relevancy. Yeah. So section 136 says that, 135 says that the power to determine relevancy, the, the power to determine whether to bring evidence or not in court will be under 135. Look at the Evidence Act. Otherwise, by discretion of the court. 136 says that the court has the power to ask questions to determine relevancy and this is question of law. Remember when we talked about relevancy last time, it is a question of law. Look at 165. <coughs> Judge's power to put questions or order production. The judge may, in order to discover or to obtain proper proof of relevant facts, ask any question he pleases in any form at any time of any witness or of the parties about any fact relevant or irrelevant and may order the production of any document or thing and neither the parties nor their agents shall be entitled to make any objection to any such question or order nor without the leave of the court to cross-examine blah blah so basically under 165 what you have here it is again relating to the power of the court since you have to read section 136, 165, 135 <coughs> together with section 5. Remember the aim here, if you are to bring evidence in the court, it has to be relevant. The judge here has the power in determining relevancy is to ask questions. So the how, how will the court determine relevancy? The court can determine relevancy by asking questions to determine whether your evidence here is relevant or not. So that is what, what happened in the case of Anwar Ibrahim. Remember I told you just now, in the case of Anwar Ibrahim, the defense want to call Mahadi and Rafida Aziz. So the judge here, <coughs> the judge here need to determine whether I should allow Mahadi and Rafida Aziz to be examined, cross-examined by the parties or not. So what happened here is that before the judge call, allow for the calling of Mahadi and Rafida Aziz, the judge basically has to clarify, are you relevant or not? Are these people relevant or not? And how did the judge do that? The judge basically asked questions to the defense. Why do you want to call these two persons? How are these, these two persons relevant to the facts and issue? And basically the reply was that we want to call these two persons because we want to prove conspiracy. And the court says that conspiracy is not part of the actus res and mens rea for this charge. Therefore, it is not relevant. You got the picture. <coughs> so what happened here? Is that when you look at the court's power here so the court here has the power to determine relevancy and this power is basically under section 136 okay you read it section 135 136 section 165 of the evidence act right now the power to determine relevancy here where the court basically can ask question now remember the practice of Malaysia we are not we are having a system that is <coughs> adversarial system. When you study Malaysian legal system last time, we follow the common law, uh, the common law of England. The practice of our court in Malaysia is that we are practicing adversarial system. Now, what is adversarial system? Adversarial system is where the court, yeah, basically have a very uh, uh, practice very passive rule. They only act as empire, yeah? 
they only act as empire in the sense that they are not too actively involved yeah in the arena of trial yeah they are not to be actively involved in the arena of trial okay this proposition that we are practicing a serial system in terms of evidence law you can have a look at the case of Tang Bung Hao <clears throat> now what happened in the case of Tang Bung Hao here is that the court was involved in excessive intervention during trial so what happened here is that you have the magistrate here right so you have the accused person here being charged so while the, the, while the uh, prosecution called witnesses, what happened here is that the magistrate in this case was the one who are actively involved doing the examination in chief, cross and re-examination. So at the defense stage, when the accused that is, is, uh, is be giving evidence during trial, again the magistrate basically undergo the process of doing the process of examination in chief, cross and re-examination. Now what happened here is that <clears throat> yeah, the judge here asked question and involved in the arena of trial, right? Arena of trial. And you have to bear in mind when you have if, if you're the accused person, you are being subjected to examination in chief, cross, and re-examination by the judge. There will be some kind of, you know, uh, 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 it will be very unfair on the accused person yeah, because you are putting pressures on him right so the process of examination in chief done by the magistrate and when the court here evaluate the court basically evaluate using the result or outcome outcome of his examination in chief cross and re-examination so the, when the matters go for trial the decision was made by the magistrate and this matter goes for appeal and on appeal, one of the arguments put forward by the defense was that the judge here intervened. The judge here involved in excessive intervention. And the court held in this case that when the judge did that, doing a questioning, ask question, examination, chief cross and re-examination, evaluate the decision based on his outcome of examination, chief cross and re-examination, the court, the, uh, the appeal court says that this amounting to excessive intervention and this may lead to miscarriage of justice. So what happened here is that the judge order a retrial. Right? The judge order a retrial. So a retrial was ordered in the case of Ten Bun Hao. In the case of Ahmad Norizan, the same situation happened whereby the trial judge excessively intervened in the process of cross-examination and he was given an acquittal upon appeal. Yeah, so bear in mind our system is adversarial system. The judge are supposed to be passive. You have two parties here: the prosecution and the defense. They will argue your case. They will submit your point of law and facts. You, as a trial judge, listen to it and evaluate to it. You are not supposed to excessively intervene, because to do so, you are basically uh, uh, putting as if this is an inquisitorial system. Yeah, our system, which is adversarial in nature. Is different from the inquisitorial system that is practiced in uh, quite a number of civil law country right so this is actually amounting to excessive intervention now how do you reconcile these cases with the one that we just discussed just now section 135 136 165 section 5 so how do you reconcile this one is that the involvement of the trial judge in this case must not be excessive it must not amounting to excessive intervention. They cannot do examination, chief cross and re-examination. Nevertheless, the judge can ask question allowed by section 136, 165 is if it is for the purpose of determining relevancy. You got the picture? So it means that the judge indeed can ask question if it is for the purpose of relevancy. Okay, you got that. So it means that Section 5 is very important. If you are to bring evidence in the court, you can, you have to, the evidence has to be relevant. And for the purpose of determining relevancy, you, the judge even can ask questions for that purpose. However, you must make sure that the questioning must not lead to excessive intervention, the judge involving in the arena of trial. Okay? So that is the position. Let's look at next. <coughs> 
So what happened now, by virtue of section 5 here, as long as the evidence is relevant, it will be admissible. The judge, because this is a question of law, once it is relevant, it fits into one of the provision, the Evidence Act, section 6, 255, then the court have to admit that particular evidence. The court, as a general rule, cannot reject yeah, the evidence if it is relevant. That will be the general rule. The rejection of the evidence, kalau it, it is too de minimis, it's too far away, right? Yeah, the, you reject the evidence if it is not relevant or admissible, or if it is too far away, yeah, that it becomes redundant or de minimis, yeah, it becomes de minimis. Okay, so now the task for you to bring evidence in the court will be relevancy. Now, then the question will be. What if you have a situation where the evidence is relevant? However, the manner in which you obtained it was improper. Improper or illegal. Yeah? The manner in which you obtained the evidence is improper and illegal. So you're talking about a situation of an illegally obtained evidence. Now, will the evidence be relevant or not? Okay. Now, if you talk about an illegally obtained evidence, as a general rule, the position under the common law, you have this in the case of Kuruma, you have this in the case of Aran Sang, yeah, and also the case of Haji Kasim. Basically, the general rule here is that the court has to admit the evidence as long as it is relevant. So the court will have to admit the evidence. As long as it is relevant. Maknanya, it fit into section 5 to 55. Now, as a general rule, the court is not concerned with how the evidence is obtained. As long as it is relevant, it will be admissible. Yeah, The court is not concerned with how the evidence is obtained. The concern of the court is that as long as it is relevant, it will be admissible. Okay? Now, what happened in the case of R and Sang is that you have the police here who has been conducting investigation and he has basically, okay, you have a lower rank police officer and katakala to conduct body search, in the case of R and Sang, to conduct body search, you require inspector and above. So, in Malaysia, basically, you have body search, you also have a situation where you have the offender who is a woman the person who conduct the body search will also be an, uh, a woman officer. So what happened in the case is that the authority, the person who conduct the post, the, the, the person who conduct the body search was a mere constable. But the law, this is a common law case, yeah. But the law in the Commonwealth, the common law country is that you have to be an inspector for you to conduct body search. So what happened here is the constable conduct body search and he found drug. And as a result, the person here is being charged for possession of drug. So the issue here, can you tender this drug as evidence or not? Right? Now in this question, will the drug be relevant to prove that you, that the accused person here liable for possession of drug? Yes, the drug will be relevant because the drug will be the subject matter of the facts and issue. That you are charged for possession of illegal substance which is drug. So the drug here is the subject matter of the facts and issue. However, the drug was illegally obtained in the sense that the police who conduct investigation, the police who seized the drug, was a person below rank. Now what happened in this case is that the court says that we are not concerned with how you obtain the evidence. As long as it is relevant, it will be admissible. So what the court did was actually doing the balancing act between the property value and prejudicial effect found that the finding of the drug is have high property value and the prejudicial effect is low despite it was illegally obtained. So that's why the evidence is relevant and admissible. Similarly, the same decision was made in the case of Kuruma. Okay? Now, having said that, even though the general rule says that the law is not concerned with how the evidence is obtained, you have to basically look at the obiter. Yeah? You have to read the obiter 
in our in Kuruma. In Kuruma against the queen. Right? What happened in the case is that there is an obita in Kuruma saying that if the evidence you are, that you obtain suffers from <coughs> if the evidence that you obtain you got it by way of excessive intervention or it is highly prejudicial yeah if it is highly prejudicial the court can exercise its discretion to reject a legally relevant evidence now what does it mean <coughs> What happened here is that the obita in Kuruma says that, okay, now the, the sorry, the, the obita in Kuruma says that if evidence is relevant and admissible, you can tender it as evidence in the court. It doesn't concern with how the evidence is obtained as long as it is relevant. So that will be the, the ratio. This will be the ratio. Yeah, the principle of law in Kuruma. However, there's an obita in Kuruma. I hope you know by now what is obita. Yeah, the obita in Kuruma says that the court will always have the discretion to disallow evidence if it goes against strict proof of admissibility in the sense that it will operate unfairly against the accused person. So what does it mean that if you have an evidence here, this particular evidence has been obtained, this evidence has been obtained by process or manner that is very, very unfair. Yeah, very, very unfair. Now, the court has a discretion to reject the evidence that you tender right, in court. So, it means that what happened here, and we basically have this in the case of Francis and Tony Sami. Whereby in the case of Francis and Tony Sami says that the court has a discretion to reject a relevant evidence if the manner in which you obtain it suffers from extraordinary involuntariness. Or in the case of Gui Ching An, in the case of Gui Ching An, it suffers from procedural impropriety. Yeah, procedural impropriety. So it means that. The evidence may be relevant and admissible in the sense that it has high property value, low prejudicial effect. However, if the manner in which you obtain it is highly prejudicial, it may have high property value, then it may have equally high prejudicial effect, the evidence may be rejected. So that is the position. So this provision, the obita in Kuruma basically... Uh, reserve the power of the court to exercise discretion to reject a legally relevant evidence. So you got that? So this is where you have a legally obtained evidence. Now you look at this PowerPoint here. Basically, we have looked at this one just now. So when we talk about relevancy, we ask a question. Okay, who has the power to determine relevancy? You find the court and the source of power within, under this law. And you basically have that. And to what extent can a judge interfere in the course of trial? Basically, you cannot interfere in the course of trial. Otherwise, it will amount to excessive intervention. You only allow to interfere is for the purpose of determining relevancy. And this will be the slides that told you about when you uh, about illegally obtained evidence, whereby as a general rule, the court is not concerned with how the evidence is obtained. However, the court has some discretion to reject a legally, active or a legally relevant evidence. And this is actually illustrated, especially in the case of Gu Ching An. Right? The case of Gu Ching An was decided three or four days after Anwar Ibrahim, in the first trial last time, was seen to have, uh, to have swollen eyes after he was being abused in the cell. Yeah? So this is what happened in the case of Gu Ching An. Alright, okay, so maknanya, bear in mind, as a general rule, the court is not concerned with how the evidence is obtained, but the court has a discretion to reject if it is, it goes very, very unfairly against the accused person. Alright, so what will happen? So this slide talk, talk about what will happen if a party objected to the relevancy of the, the evidence, right? 
What happened here is that if a party objected to the relevancy of an, uh, uh, an admissibility of an evidence, you will have a trial within a trial. So a voided trial or a trial within a trial is a forum or a process in which the party can challenge the relevancy and admissibility of a trial. So what is a voided trial? Basically, it, uh, it is a, a mini trial. Now, how do I illustrate this one? So how do I explain this one? Look at the case of Anwar Ibrahim Sodomi 2. Anwar Ibrahim Sodomi 2. You look at the case of Anwar Ibrahim Sodomi 2. Basically, what you have, remember, Anwar Ibrahim, there was, uh, you have Saiful here making an allegation that Anwar Ibrahim sodomized him. Right? And Anu Saiful was keeping his evidence with him for a few days and eventually he go to the hospital Kuala Lumpur and get his, the evidence retrieved from him. So sample was taken from him. So the sample was taken from by doctor number one, doctor two, and then doctor three. And the sample is actually given to the IO and the IO now give to doctor four to do examination, the chemist, yeah? examination to determine the DNA that was found from the sample. So basically G4 do the examination from the sample taken from the HKL and found that the sample contained DNA that uh, contained DNA of Saiful and contained another DNA of Mr. X. So we don't know who is this Mr. X. And in the meantime, Saful, when he made a complaint, so basically police start investigation, police stop Anwar Ibrahim and bring him to the cell. So you have Anwar Ibrahim and he was brought to the cell. And remember when you are brought to, the, to a cell, you have to be produced before the magistrate within 24 hours. This will be your criminal procedure code. Within, proce within 24 hours, you have to be produced before the magistrate but once you were, were brought to the police station, you can be interrogated yeah, up until 24 hours. So what happened here is that Anwar Ibrahim was interrogated in the uh, uh, when he was at the police station. He has with him at that time a mineral water bottle. A mineral water bottle. So after interrogation, he was kept in his cell. And the next morning when he was about to go to the magistrate, he was given a good morning towel. Yeah, and was it and was also given a toothbrush and toothpaste. Yeah, toothpaste and toothbrush. Where well, he used it and he was he left the cell to see the magistrate. Once he left the cell, the forensic went into the cell first. So the forensic retrieved from the cell. So you have the forensic. Retrieve the cell. From the uh, retrieve the mineral water bottle, good morning towel, and the toothbrush, and bring it to D4. Bawa dia kat D4, where D4 examining, examine the sample, and D4 now know that this is DNA Anwar Ibrahim. Yeah, Anwar Ibrahim. And then, what happened was that D4 match kan. Yeah, the D4 match DNA that was obtained from Saiful found that you have Saiful DNA and DNA of Mr. Sex here, Mr. X here actually match with the DNA of Anwar Ibrahim. So he was saying that the person who sodomized Saiful was actually Anwar Ibrahim. So Mr. X is Anwar Ibrahim. So now the prosecutor in court wish to tender the evidence that was obtained from the mineral water good morning towel mineral water bottle good morning towel and the toothbrush so what happened here is that during trial of this case the prosecutor tell the court young arif we retrieve samples from the cell that was stayed by anwar ibrahim we wish to tender the mineral water bottle the good morning towel and the toothpaste the toothbrush we want to mark it as exhibit 1 until 3. That is what proposed by the prosecutor. The moment the prosecutor proposed it, right, the defense, Anwar Ibrahim punya lawyer, objected yang arif, this evidence was improperly obtained. Yeah, this is what happened. 
So the moment there was an objection by the defense as to the relevancy and admissibility of an evidence, they have to, they have to uh, suspend the main trial. So what happened here is that the main trial was suspended. The main trial was suspended to allow for a Vaudier trial. So a Vaudier trial here will, okay, now it's, it's like a main trial. You can see the same first person. The process of examination in chief, cross and re-examination will happen. The prosecutor will still going to call his prosecution witness. And uh, the process will be like that. And at the end of a Vaudier trial, the evidence of the prosecution here will be evaluated beyond reasonable doubt to determine whether the evidence that you tender in court is relevant and admissible or not. Whereby at the end of a Vaudier trial conclusion, there is only one fact and issue that, that is whether the evidence that you tender is relevant and admissible or not. So that will be the conclusion of trial. At the end of the day, court can decide, evaluate, it decide. So the evidence is relevant. So if it is relevant, it will be tendered in the main trial. If it is not relevant, then the evidence is not tendered, cannot be tendered in the main trial. So what happened in this case is that, when the prosecutor argued this case, the, the, sorry, when the defense argued this case, the defense says that you obtained a mineral water bottle, the good morning towel, and the toothbrush, a toothbrush without the consent of my client. So my client here did not consent to you retrieving her, his DNA. So this is illegally obtained evidence. That's what the court, the, uh, the defense was arguing. And the court says that, sorry, and the prosecutor says that, well, this is illegally obtained evidence. We have Kuruma saying and whatnot. So the court held in this case is what the court held in this case is that the court is applying the case of Kuruma and Sang, and the court says that we are not concerned with how we obtain the evidence as long as it is relevant, it will be admissible. So the case of Anwar Ibrahim is the latest case among the latest case which upholds the position of common law on illegally obtained evidence. You got that? And now, so what happened here is that when can you object to the tendering of evidence? So the moment an evidence is proposed to be produced by the prosecutor, that will be the best time for you to object. So the objection will be at the time when the prosecutor proposes it. So if there's a proposed, there's a there's an objection, they are gonna have a trial within a trial. Now, if you propose to it, then it will be good because failure to propose sometimes will result in as if you allow that particular evidence to be tendered. Katakanlah what happened here is that the prosecutor is proposing to tender a document. Defense bought senyap je, right? The silence of the defense referring to can be referred to as consent. So, maknanya they are agreeable to the submitting of that particular evidence. So that's why in some cases, you have to object to the tendering of evidence the moment it is tendered, right? In some cases, the moment you object to, maknanya court akan record kan that you objected to it. Sometimes, the court has to be cautioned first. Also, yeah, the court also has to be cautioned. If you objected to it, but the court is not sure whether your objection is valid or not, the court may bring the evidence in first and later reject it. So the court can do that, okay? You got the picture there. Alright? So that will be the position. This will be the case of Anwar Ibrahim. And this is what we discussed just now. When can objection of evidence be made? Alright? So with this discussion, basically we have completed introduction in section 5 of the Evidence Act 1950. And the next lecture, we are going to look at relevancy proper in which we will start off with section 6 of the Evidence Act which is evidence which relates to same transaction.